Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to The Black Tower Show. I'm your host, Nathan Ford. We're in BC Studios, broadcasting 1040 AM, 92.1 FM, WYSL, Rochester, Buffalo. Jake Fox is here in studio, upstate New York. And it's getting a little bit warmer out there. The thaw is happening. People are standing up a little more straight. And there's a general air of happiness, which we're not accustomed to in upstate New York. There's kind of a cheeriness as people are looking forward to the summer here. This, you know, we're going to have summer for maybe, I don't know, three weeks, let's say. And then it will start snowing again, to be pessimistic. You know? Yeah, we, we get in all of our festivals and and all of those, and our smiles into those three weeks. And then, yeah. <laughs> we have three <laughs> weeks of smiles, and then it's back to the snow again. By a shovel. But what an honor to have Marie D. Jones on the Black Tower Show. We're huge fans. Marie is a best-selling author, screenwriter, research, radio show host, public speaker. She's the author of 2013 End of Days or A New Beginning, Envisioning the World After the Events of 2012. Also uh, the book Science, P-S-I-E-N-C-E, Science, How New Discoveries in Quantum Physics and New Science May Explain the Existence of Paranormal Phenomena. And looking for God in all the wrong places, Marie's newest book, Destiny vs. Choice, The Scientific and Spiritual Evidence Behind Fate and Free Will. And I also want to mention uh, 1111, Time Trap Phenomenon, that you co-authored with Larry Flaxman. That's also a great book, and I want to get to that as well. Um, this is a quote. We've had Jim Mars on the show, and you have a quote on your website, Jim Mars. This, this is a quote from Jim Mars, author of New York Times bestseller, Alien Agenda. He wrote, quote, Marie Jones has joined the list of forward-thinking individuals who are taking us to the next level in both science and our understanding of the universe and our place in it. It's a quote from Jim Mars. Marie D. Jones, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Well, thanks for having me. You had to pay Jim a lot of money to get him to say that. I'm sure you did. You had to, you had to throw him a few dollars. No, I'm sure he did that one on the house. <laughs> Humans, he's a great guy. I love him. Yeah, he's great. We had a great interview with him. Yeah. Humans, humans on an elemental level are energy. And yep. it seems to me we are constantly moving and even in death, it seems yeah. that this energy may persist. I think yep. of the cosmic serpent, the double helix of DNA, and the, the shamans that I've read about who have an understanding of molecular biology that goes even beyond our own right. understanding. Mm -hmm. For instance, knowing to pair certain plants for healing purposes, complex recipes brought to them seemingly by a deep connection to the earth and the idea of time. That the ability to perceive and exchange energy on this molecular level is something that humans may have within themselves, a talent within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it raises questions about free will, about the existence of other universes that are interacting seemingly unbeknownst to us. Now, in your book, Destiny vs. Choice, you discuss this interplay between science, energy, and the idea of being free to make one's own decisions. And my first question is, what does quantum mechanics tell us about our ability to understand destiny and or choice? I think it tells us really I mean, that anything is possible. Because when you look at the way that subatomic particles behave and how much of their behavior is dependent on uh, having a conscious observer, what it tells you is that there is a field of all possibility. And so that, in a, in a sense, represents the fact that we have choice, we have free will, anything goes. Mm. But when we observe something, when we collapse the wave function of something, when we create something into a, a physical manifest reality, that is a choice that we're making that some people think might imply destiny. Because once you make a choice, it often sets in motion a lot more choices, a lot more results, cause and effect, mm. like a wheel that you can't stop. It's almost as if the two exist at the same time. And I really believe that. After I wrote Destiny versus Choice, I, you know, I had always leaned more towards there being destiny. I felt like even though we have a lot of choice at the fundamental level of existence, we still have to choose from this field of potentiality, mm. this sort of quantum field. We have to observe things into existence, and that's where we have the choice and the free will. But we still have some kind of limitation as to how we can do that. 
And so, in other words, my destiny may be to be a writer. Mm. That's a choice that I make every day. Mm. But it's also something that I feel like I came into this world with, certain talents, certain gifts Mm. that, you know, I picked up with me when I was back in the ether, Mm -hmm. came into this unique incarnation with. Um, so I can have a destiny, and I can also have the free will and choice not to pursue that destiny, not to fulfill it, not to acknowledge it. And the thing about quantum physics is that everything exists and nothing exists. So you've got both free will and destiny. There, You've got fundamentally the idea that everything exists, but you also have choices that must be made within that in order to actually manifest something into sort of a a physical form. Mm. And that's kind of hard to explain, but I think one good way to explain it is this. In terms of the quantum world, there is that field of potentiality. However, no matter how hard I try, and maybe it's just the level of consciousness that we're at as human beings, no matter how hard I try, I cannot turn myself into a frog. Mm. Okay, so I exist with a lot of limitations that I'm born with genetically. I'm a human being. I'm part of a certain species that does not look like a frog. You know, I have characteristics that I come into this world with based upon my my parents and their parents. I have a sort of genetic destiny. And yet there are so many things that once I'm here in this world, I can choose. Mm. I can. I have total free will. I can go live as a hermit. I can become a surfer. I can cut my hair. I can dye it blonde. So we live our lives with that sort of... Um, that doesn't sound like a bad life, being a surfer, though, you know? So <laughs> yeah, I know. I know a, a lot of surfers. Let me tell you, I swear, though, I don't know how they make their money. Well, I do know how some of well, them Well, some, cho- some people do choose that kind of life path. Yeah, life and it of, is a choice. Uh, and you know what, though? I think also there is a little bit of destiny implied there as well because you have to have, this is what I've learned living in Southern California, is you have to, because I'm from New York, you have to have a certain mindset, a way that you view the world, a way that you view life in order to be a good surfer. I Mm. could not do Mm. it. I'm way too type A, uh, you know. (laughs) I mean, it's it's like they're a whole different species. But it's just one of those indications that when you really kind of bring out who you are, uh, what your your unique talents and gifts are that you came into the world with, you can fulfill a potential destiny. Mine, again, I always knew since I was very little, was to be a writer. But you still have incredible amount of choice as to how you do that, when you do it, and, and again, whether you are choose to, to do it or not. My gut always tells me, you know, it, my gut gives me an, a linear answer to the nature of reality, that we are bound by the parameters. That's like what I feel in my gut, that we, we are bound to some degree, that we, we do understand the world in a linear way, and that right. we, these laws right. are set in place. And I've seen people in deep meditation who can control their brainwave activity. Oh, it's and, biofeedback. Yeah, and yeah, inter- interviews you've mentioned, things like losing time, different right. ways that we right. experience time. And it's, it's interesting that yeah. when we are overwhelmed with life's input, that we're, you know, when we're dealing with a lot, it does seem kind of like time slows up or freezes. What are your thoughts right. on how humans experience time and maybe how we can manipulate it? It's a, it's a perception issue. You know, when, when everything is going really well and you're having a great time, you know, time flies when you're having fun. I mean, how cliche is that? But it's true. And other times when you're at work, if you hate your job <laughs> and you hate your boss mm. or you're in, you know, a college class and you're just, uh, you're just taking it because you need to get the grade, time will slow down. And so it's a matter of perception because really time is going the same outside of you. It, they're actually, outside of you, time doesn't even exist. But the brain perceives time in different ways depending on the amount of information coming into the brain that needs to be processed, understood, dealt with, filtered out, what have you. And that's why when people go on vacations, unless they really are good at, like you said, 
meditators are very good at this. Unless they're really good at just staying in the moment, mm. often people will say their vacation went by so quickly they didn't even get to enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. I think it has other, like it has more implications too because if you are able to quiet the mind, so to speak, mm-hmm. like people who are meditating, um, if you are able to quiet your mind, it does change your attitude. So when yeah. you see people who are doing these sort of things, I think of Ken Wilber as a uh, person. You can go online and watch him. And right. He actually controls his brainwaves to some degree. But it changes your whole demeanor. It changes the things that you're saying. It changes your whole character. Exactly. And so, therefore, the people that you're around are different. You're attracting well, different types of people. Everything exactly. does kind of change. You know what I mean? Yeah, you can't. I think you naturally attract people that are now, I hate to sound all woo-woo, but kind of vibrating on the same frequency as you are, because when you get into that sort of present moment for just, you know, free mindset where you're not worried about the past or stressing out over the future, you're naturally going to want to be around other people that are the same way so that they don't bring you back down into that, you know, the Mm. quagmire of worrying and stressing and anxiety. But sometimes it's hard to find those other people. <laughs> That's true. Sure. Sure. And, I, I mean, it's, it does seem to me that we live in an over-anxious time. We do, you and know, I think it's getting worse, yeah. And I think that's directly related to the overwhelming amount of information. Uh, you know, let's blame it on technology. Uh, I love right. technology, <laughs> but it, it also overwhelms us with so much information that we now have to weed through, to figure out what's important to us, what matters, and what's just trash. And our brains are just overwhelmed now with doing that. With text messages and emails and, you know, YouTubes and social networking and this, that, and the other thing. It's the unquiet mind to the tenth power. Well, I think we have it a little bit backwards here in America because when we think about what freedom is and the actual definition of freedom, we think, well, if we have more choices, if we have more options, then that's equals freedom that's such a misleading thing because it's exactly the opposite to some degree right of course (laughs) options of you know when it comes to my physical safety and those sort of things those are different right we we have so many options here and it's too many (laughs) is it it too many is it too many yeah know what you want and but, yeah, I mean, we think we're such hot stuff with all this advanced technology, and yet what it's really served to do is put us in a state of constant and incessant distraction. I am guilty as well. I have to stop myself. I have to, you know, try to stop my son, too. And I, I fear, you know, the kids, the next generation and the generation after that, they're not going to know the pleasure of going and playing outside and just losing track of time until it gets dark out and your mom's yelling out the door for you to come in for dinner. You know, that's how I grew up. Mm. But it's, it's, I don't know that it's something that we can label good or bad until we see what these kids do with it. Yeah. But it is hard. I see it getting harder and harder for people to calm down, to relax, to have a good time in the moment, um, to enjoy their vacation, to enjoy their days off. Mm. Mm. And I think that we're, it's, information overload Mm. yeah you've done a lot of work dealing with the paranormal and when we talk about our minds as being able to pick up radio signals we've talked to courtney brown and uses this idea that our mind is able to pick up you know kind of radio signals from Mm -hmm. you know from from everywhere and you mentioned resonance Um, right uh, i wonder to what degree we are experiencing ghosts and spirits that have changed their energy forms Uh, you know, all the instances that people talk about, you know, experiencing the paranormal. Is there a way to become more in tune to the paranormal world? And when we do have those instances, which I've had personally, where I feel like I'm interacting with the paranormal world, is that my, is that my mind kind of picking up or tuning in, in a sense, uh, resonating with right, uh, another reality? Is, that's what's hap- is that what's happening, in your opinion? You know, I mean, I can't say for sure. There's no proof. <laughs> But of course, yeah. the brain does act as both a, ran, a receiver and a transmitter of, of different frequencies, different resonances. It is possible that everything that we experience is our reality, the one that the five senses are so desperately hanging on to. Uh, our brain is literally keying in or tuning in to certain frequencies. 
and perceiving and experiencing whatever is vibrating at the same frequency. So the idea of resonance is changing, tuning to a different radio station in your head, finding a way to change your brain waves or alter your consciousness or something, uh, some kind of alliance between what's happening environmentally and physiologically mm. that allows us to tune into different frequencies and we get to see and experience the realities on those frequencies. Mm. Larry Flaxman and I, my co-author, we came up with the grid, which is just a our visual way of trying to describe this sort of hidden infrastructure of reality, which really isn't just one reality. I mean, I think we all know, based on our personal experiences, again, we have no proof of this, but based on our personal experiences of the paranormal, we know there's other things going on out there, okay? Mm -hmm. they're, they may be happening in a different universe, a different dimension, a different timeline. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But they're happening to so many people. So we now have to try to take a look at the fact that our reality, the one that we live in every day, may be just one of many that make up this sort of three-dimensional grid where you've got levels of reality that are all interconnected somehow. And mm -hmm. every now and then we get to experience what's going on in one of those other levels. Mm. And do we do that by tuning into that frequency of that level? Possibly. Well, Possibly. do you personally make strides to to try to enhance that within yourself to find a way to you sort of I've tune kind in? Of found, I may be a total freak in this because I've always been really frustrated because I don't have a lot of paranormal experiences. Mm. And then I realized, God, I did when I was a little kid. Mm. Oh, I had them all the time. So uh, I didn't, I mean, I didn't really see a ghost or a, an alien or anything, but I always had a strong sense of, of a hidden reality. And I grew up the daughter of a scientist, so, mm. you know, I was always aware that there was a science behind all that, that there was nothing separating science from the paranormal. We just didn't understand how the science of the paranormal worked yet. But here's what I kind of noticed. The older that I got, the more distracted, the more... Um, separated from, from maybe nature, from those quiet present moment activities that I grew up with, the harder it was to experience that. Mm. So for me, my belief is this stuff is happening all the time, okay? It's happening on all these different levels of reality. What is keeping us from having a constant experience or interaction with this phenomenon or, or these different realities. I think there's two things going on. One, we're too distracted, we're too stressed out, we're mm. too focused on other things mm. to resonate with those frequencies mm -hmm. unless we really, you know, make it a, a priority. Mm. Or two, we're not meant to experience that stuff all the time. And I think that that might have to do with just a sheer survival mechanism built into our brains. Mm. Because if we could access the paranormal 24-7, if we could experience other realities 24-7, how do we function in this one? And I think consciousness, I believe, goes beyond the limitation of the five senses. Mm. But in order to live one incarnation at a time, consciousness must be focused sure and that, that, I mean, that's, that's a, yeah. my feeling it's you know mm. it, that maybe we're only meant to get glimpses to keep reminding us that that we're, we're grander and greater than we think and that there's more than meets the eye to existence but yeah. to do that all the time i don't know i think a lot of people would go crazy <laughs> well, <laughs> well you have these moments in time where for me personally where i'm i'm literally overwhelmed with just how beautiful the world is. I, yeah. I, I can't describe it. You know, it's very hard to describe because it isn't anything that can be pinned down in that right. way. Right. There's no words. So, and so we try with our meek little vocabulary. Well, I mean, can you imagine absolutely. living in that your whole life in this yeah. sort of awe? You feel really you know? opened up in a way. I would have no but problem imagine, living in a, in, a, in a cardboard house somewhere. I wouldn't have But any. imagine if that um, happened to you all the time. You know what would happen? You wouldn't appreciate it anymore, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I feel like that. But I think that we get those glimpses, and I have this happen too. I think we get them as reminders. Don't, you know, don't worry. <laughs> There's more to what's going on than, than you know. Yeah. And I think that that's enough. I mean, some people, I think, get more than others. I believe that has to do with 
certain things in their physiology that allow them to experience this stuff more. Yeah. Whether it's a difference in brain chemicals or hormones or, you know, what you had for dinner. I think that, that everything about us as human beings interacts in, with the environment and influences our perception of reality or other realities. And some people have different interactions than others. But I don't know anybody short of some Buddhist monks, you know, in a monastery somewhere that live in that altered state of awareness 24-7. Yeah. Because I think for most of us, it's an impetus to strive to, to have better lives, to love people more, to do better. Sure. Whereas if it happened all the time, we would just become bored with it. Funny that those the Buddhist monks are also, you know, actively suppressing um, what I would call like primal needs yeah, to propagate this, you know, propagate <laughs> the species, if you will. Yeah. Um, no. And and. But do you think you have to go to that extent? I mean, mm. it, you know, I don't know. Maybe we just lost the ability to allow that to happen naturally. Well, I think maybe they have the right intention in getting rid of distractions. I think that's really important. Sure, attachments, like People always yeah. say, how can I experience other realities and altered states of consciousness? Well, you know, turn off the computer. <laughs> that's yeah. a good one. And, and just, you've you got to go inward. You can't get it going outward. And I think that's where they understand that. But mm. I hate to think that we have to, like, give up everything yeah. In order to experience that. And maybe that's why, for most of us, we only get those little teases, those little glimpses, because we have lives that we live. And we've chosen these lives. We've chosen to have jobs and careers and families and children. And so we got to, at some point, keep our consciousness focused. <laughs> yeah. Know? Just pluck those weeds out of there. you got to get the weeds out. Yeah. And... Yeah. You know, I, I, Buddhism, it, it's always very difficult for me to embrace a lot of it because it is, you know, it mentions dancing and sort of celebration of life mm -hmm. as that's something that we have to get rid of, that attachment to even the very, very good things, the celebratory things. And that's yeah, you're, like that's what you're road, saying, but, sure. Right. For some people, it might be too, too down the middle. Yeah. Yeah. We're hooked on extremes, whether they're positive or negative. Mm. It seems to some degree like we are, in fact, influenced greatly by other people's energy. Uh, sim yeah. A simple look or even the essence of a person can have a real impact on us. Someone walking into the room have a, you know, has a bad day. Their energy, their resonance, their vibration, sure. their frequency. Yeah, man, you're giving me a bad vibe. It's, sure. It's is there a, a part of our language. Is there a way to control how much we are actually influenced by people's energy, say their negative energy, let alone what we were mentioned before, the computer technology, exactly. the media that's also feeding those sort of things. You know, for people, is that something that they should be actively pursuing, a way I to would, do that? I would think. I know it's, you know, most people sort of operate by default, but I think, you know, you see a lot of people talking about staying away from toxic family members or negative drama and and that's why that's sort of a cry for help that you're surrounded by other people's frequencies mm. that are not uplifting you know they're not supporting your frequency or your vibration or your level of consciousness i think a lot of times we fall prey to things like guilt when we have family oh, yeah. members that bring us down like that on a constant basis maybe they're they're you know abusive or narcissistic or they're just very negative mm. very downbeat people but they're still our family they might even be our spouse um, but i think it's a real uh it, it's a conscious effort that people have to make to sort of surround themselves with a coating of white light or whatever you want to I mean, it, mm. it can be a, a coat of armor and just constantly reminding yourself that other people's bs is not yours you know, I know some people say they imagine that they have sort of a deflector shield around them. So mm. other people's drama and negativity and bad energy just literally bounces off the deflector shield. But that's hard to keep thinking about all day. Sure. We're getting focused on other things, and then before we know it, our boss comes in and yells at us 
because she's having a bad day or what have you, and here we are feeling like crap again. Um, but I, I think it's a conscious effort to realize that even though we're all connected on that quantum level, there still is separation between mm. us, and we need to protect our energy. Why do I feel at the core that it is that there is no rhyme or reason, that it is confusion at the very core? Like when I am quiet in my time, I feel that there is no intention, that it is things spiraling to some degree out of control. Why is it that I feel it's that? chaos. Yes. But when you observe chaos, you can find order. I think that's, you know, the act of the observer bringing order to disorder Mm. I think our brains do that all the time where our brains literally are bombarded with chaos in the form of information. Yeah. But we seek pattern. We seek things that make sense to us or that we kind of have dealt with before, we recognize, or we feel comfortable with. I think, it, you know, the the most fundamental level of existence is said to literally be a sea of quantum particles popping in and out of existence talk about utter chaos mm, mm. and yet you know the sheer act of con conscious observation will bring some kind of order to that and, yeah. and out of that comes things that we're familiar with matter mm. form what you know the forces of the universe what have you so i think that we know that there's chaos surrounding us but i think it's incredibly empowering to realize that we have the choice, go back to the choice, of where we put our focus and our attention on. And so we can always find some kind of order out of that disorder. We can always find some, something that makes sense in the chaos and focus on that because what we focus on, that's what expands in our reality. Mm, mm. Easier said than done. Well, easier said than done because I think, you know, the, the you the people naturally fall into the paradigm of just pleasing yourself pleasing yourself yeah. of course that's that that is what it is and uh you know i don't want to make it into a therapy session here with marie d jones <laughs> <laughs> it's too much fun to talk about <laughs> hey i love this i'll get let's get right into it let's just open up and bear our souls to each other <laughs> yeah but that's you know we're, we're all really struggling to try to figure out what the heck reality is let alone these paranormal realities that we're surrounded by sure yeah it's a difficult thing and i know i mean i've read a lot of buddhist writings and things and this idea of compassion and understanding for people is something that it makes so it makes so much sense to me like on a reasonable right. level but it's it, there's always been a disconnect with how i actually feel because at the yeah. end of the day i will make myself happy and it's funny because we talk a lot about the corruption in the government we talk about you know, false flag attempts. We talk about all of the kind of horrible nature of our government, all the things that are happening. And it's funny that it, I do believe it all stems from pleasing yourself and doing well, things within the self-interest kind of paradigm. Right, but it's also the government is nothing more than the mirror, a mirror of the people it represents. Exactly. We're all in this together. So we are all, we all have in our lives false flags lies, deceptions, you know, everything that we accuse our government of, we as individuals carry with us and are guilty of. And I've always believed that, that we get the government that we mirror out I agree. As, a, as a collective. I'm not saying individually. And I think that that's a really good way to look at mm. where we're at as a collective, where we're at as a species by what we allow to govern us. Because... The, the same kind of big high-level deceptions that go on in the halls of government and the judiciary and in religious institutions go on in our individual lives. And I've always, when people say, well, you know, we need to clean up the government, and then I'm thinking, okay, you need to clean up your life first. I need to clean up mine. When, ev when all of the individuals are living cleaned up lives, we're not going to mirror that kind of crap back out into our government. We're going to attract the same kind of people representing us that we are. <laughs> you yeah. know, and it's so hard to get people to think about that. Yeah. You've got a, a, a populace that lies and cheats and steals and deceives, 
governed by people who lie, cheat, steal, and deceive. And, and it's like, okay, <laughs> think about that, people. <laughs> but again, you know, no, that's not right. everybody. It's, a, it's something that needs to be tackled in a collective sense. Yeah. We, we, our government, our leadership, whether it's religious or not or political or what have you, they really mirror back to us who we are and what we allow However, they, you know, there are powerful people that do control the flow of media and ideas that are, yeah, you know, that are made very pervasive in our culture. Yeah. So, I mean, to what degree do they have some kind of responsibility for shaping how we view and think about even exactly. being in a relationship, being in I a marriage, a of, what a marriage might mean? Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah, I think there's a, I think narcissism is running rampant in uh, society today. Yeah. And I think that that's reflected in this, this sort of lustful quest for power and control. It's always been there. We've always had corrupt people, corrupt mm. individuals. But now they get to be even more corrupt on a bigger scale <laughs> because everything happens on such a global level. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I think there are a handful of people that really need to be dealt with. Sure. Um, but the thing we have to ask ourselves is why don't we? You know, why don't we? What is it about the consciousness of the collective that stops short of recognizing that there may be a handful of people out there that have their thumb on all of us? I think it's the futility of life. I think it's the fact that we know that we're going to die. And I think a lot of people are riding it out. They're riding it out yeah, to see what it kinda, is that I'll we can do. I'll get what's good until I die and who cares about the rest. Sure. I always feel like I've got to leave something behind for my kid. Sure. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well. But that's energy. And I, I always feel like, what is the very best thing I can do for the world? Mm. Is it scream and yell and rant on Facebook? Which I do, because <laughs> I'm a That's Italian. awesome. But really, the best thing I can do for the world is clean up my act. Because mm. yeah. then I'm going to be vibrating at a higher level. And then people around me are going to feel it and hopefully respond to it. And if, I think, you know, if everybody did that, if everybody cleaned up their own individual, put their houses in order, I mean, it was in, wasn't in the Bible, mm. get your own house in order. Get your own house in order. Then um, the bigger houses would have to be put in order because that's what we would demand. Mm. You know, mm. we wouldn't settle for anything less. We're talking to Marie D. Jones. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. In the Trinity Secret, you discuss the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. The idea that there could be a code or some kind of recipe, if you will, within it. And I want to ask you, what kind of messages um, do you believe are to be understood from the concept of the Holy Trinity? And other kind of concepts like that. What is it, how is it that people should be thinking about it um, you know, when, when we're discussing the Trinity and, and, the, and the codes involved there? Could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, this is something that I actually wrote about this a long time ago. Because when I was little, my sister and I, we grew up sort of semi-Roman Catholic. And I say semi because my parents were not religious. But <clears throat> my, all of our, you know, my grandparents were over from the boat Italians. <laughs> and you had to be Catholic. So you had mm. to go to church on Christmas and Easter and go to communion and all that kind of stuff. And so yeah. I grew up with some of that when I was young. And I actually loved the ritual. I loved the beauty. Uh, what I didn't yeah. like is that as I got older, listening to the actual words, you know, a lot of it didn't make sense. So one of the things that never made sense to me was the concept of the Trinity as the persona of God or a sort of three-faced persona of what the the Catholic belief of God, and read mm. all about it for years, studied it. You know, it always bothered me that, you know, the number three was involved, because I always knew that the number three was very, very, very important. Throughout my life, I've seen 333, three, three, and I've had a lot of, quote, three, unquote, experiences. Mm. And when Larry and I set out, we actually wrote a book called 1111, The Time Prompt Phenomenon, which... Uh, got into the very mysterious and paranormal nature of numbers and mathematics. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we kept running across when we were doing the research for that book 
was the prevalence of the number three throughout different religions and mythology and storytelling and, you know, just all this stuff. It's like, why is the number three? What the heck? What's yeah. going on here? And then going back and looking at the Trinity and realizing Father, Son, Holy Spirit, wow, doesn't that sound an awful lot like David Bohm, grandfather of quantum physics, my favorite physicist, mm. his orders of reality, the the implicate, the explicate, and the superimplicate, doesn't that sound an awful lot like a process yeah. by which everything is created, the actual process of creation? Started thinking more and more about it and started finding what we like to call circumstantial evidence because it's not proof that maybe the Trinity, and maybe one of the reasons why Catholicism has struggled with this concept for so long and never quite been able to explain it, is because it's not describing the face of God. It's describing the process of creation. Okay, you have a father. You have a super implicate. You have a, a creative force, right? You have a creator. Yeah. You have a son which is the explicate, the manifest, the mm. physical manifestation of reality, okay? Mm. But what's the missing element? That elusive, mysterious Holy Spirit, which was actually described in the Old Testament as the, the yeast, the breath of God, that which gives life, that, that which animates. Mm. So you've got Creator, the Father. You've got creation, the Son, the physical manifestation. And you have the act of creation itself. So we started to look at those three aspects as being the code of creation. And we went through quantum physics, and we went through science and religion and myth and storytelling, and it found that there were correlations to this process in everything. I mean, we're talking even the art of storytelling or the, uh, telling a dramatic story where you've got a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, you know, fairy tales where you've got the little pig, the middle pig, and the big pig, and each of those pigs has a purpose, has a progression towards the final perfect culmination. So it's just kind of describing the train of thought that I go through and that Larry and I go through when we're coming up for an idea for a book. Mm. And once we looked at the Trinity as a code or a process of creation, it totally made sense. It totally made sense. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. The Creator, the creation, and the act of creating. That's it. That's what everything comes down to. Yeah. And it's all connected. Hmm. So aiming to explain <coughs> life kind of, uh, you know, on a molecular level, perhaps. Because, you know, when I grew up in a Pentecostal Christian church, the Holy Spirit was an actual social phenomenon that we experienced in church, you know. Uh, I remember my father, who was a worship leader, would actually, during the, you know, what, when he was leading worship, he would actually talk about the Holy Spirit entering in at that time. Right, it's that energy, that creative energy that's yeah. going to bring forth something. Yeah. Yeah. I well, think there's so many clues in in the language in the Bible itself, and just the fact that the Holy Spirit has always been the hardest element to explain. And I think because too many people, and I've read a lot of books about the Trinity, Trinity scholarship, and the confusion and the frustration of, well, the Father is God, obviously the Son is Christ. Christ is really the Father made manifest on earth in a physical form. Yeah. <laughs> but it required this act of creation. Mm. It required this yeast. I mean, you can't make bread without the yeast. It required this breath being breathed into the Christ in order for him to be manifest. And, you know, here I was seeing all this, and I'm thinking, okay, God's the creator. Jesus is the physical manifest creation, and the Holy Spirit is the act by which you create something. You can't have anything become a part of reality without that three-step process. And if you take a step out, you get nothing. Mm. So really it was the sort of process by which something comes out of nothing. Yeah. And it just matched so perfectly with, again, with Bohm's implicate and explicate in the super implicate order that I thought, wow, that's really cool. He's a, a physicist, very metaphysical in his line of thinking, 
but if he sees that same process going on by which physical forms are manifest from the quantum world, then why can't that be how religious people a long time ago envisioned creation itself? And they didn't have the scientific acumen or vocabulary vocabulary to describe it any other way. Mm. God, you know, the Father, the Son. The Father is that invisible guy or cho- chooser who says, I'm going to make this. <laughs> the Son is the manifestation of that decision or choice. Yeah. And, of course, there's got to be a process by which God cre- puts, it, you know, puts it all into motion. How did you get into this? How, um, did, how, how, did, you, <laughs> how did you take this path? I, I need to know. Get into what? You mean all of this? <laughs> all of this. This... <laughs> This is. I, I was born a really weird kid. <laughs> Let me tell you. Very inquisitive, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh God, I was terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I started talking and writing very early, and I was writing constantly as a kid, writing stories. Uh, I had a. I grew up a tomboy. You know, I had a chem- chemistry set and a geology kit and a bird watching kit, and mm. I'd go out in nature and track animals and write about it in my little notebook and put it in my book bag and. Yeah. My dad was a scientist, and that just blew me away. I loved science, and my mom was a storyteller. She's just really creative and imaginative. I grew up straddling both, fen- you know, both sides of the fence. Yeah, the imaginative and the creative, and and the paranormal and the unusual and the hard science. And I always was able to put the two together with no problems. As I got older, and I was writing more and more, I was shocked by the division that I saw between the worlds of science and, you know, the unknown anomalies or the paranormal, whatever you want to call it, because I always felt like science is capable of describing what's going on. We, (laughs) scientists, just haven't caught up with it yet. Mm. Because really, science is what? It just describes how something works. We just haven't caught up with it yet. So, yeah, that was... I And I, I I didn't have like a experience when I was young. I wasn't abducted by aliens or I didn't see a ghost when I was three. I just came out inquisitive, curious, and creative. And having a dad who was traveling all over the world, he's a geophysicist, and whenever there was a major earthquake, he would go to that country and he'd come back with slides and pictures and, you know, all kinds of stuff. I was digging my backyard up for fossils at the age of seven, and I just... I've always been that way. But people will always say, well, you must have seen something. You must Mm. have had a ghost encounter. No, (laughs) I didn't. (laughs) At least I don't remember. It's funny. It makes me think when I was younger, I was just talking with my family about a memory of me catching dragonflies with my Uh friend growing up. And I remember having, to this day, it was the happiest point of my life. And I had this kind of deep conversation with my mother about, well, Why was it that that was such a huge thing for me? And I just remember catching the dragonflies and sort of appreciating that each dragonfly was different, that each dragonfly had different colors and different little dots on it, and just the wonderment of how vast and amazing the world was. It shocked me. It shocked me. And it had nothing to do with... It had nothing to do with, uh, you know, selfishness or uh, no. being, a, being a certain way. It was at a point when you're young, and you mentioned being young, is that you are separated from, and you're unattached to some degree um, yeah. from things. So I always right. kind of go right. back to that. <laughs> and I've, I, I, to be honest with you, I've been spending my whole life trying to get back to that feeling. Uh, yeah, I totally <laughs> can relate to you. That quest again for that same sense of awe and wonder yeah, that I mean, we had. I used to catch fireflies and caterpillars, and I know t- I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. And so you think about, well, that world is still out there, isn't it? Or was yeah. it our perception that changed? Is it us? And I think it's just, you know, as adults, because you hit that certain age. For me, it was 13, yeah. where it, reality sets in. And, you know, no longer can you really run around and chase dragonflies. And you now you got to think about school more and then getting a job. It's just like responsibility. But sure. I love being around people who still have that awe and wonder, where they're not jaded and cynical and like, oh, 
been there, done that, seen everything. You know, where you can just go outside and look at a flower and go, whoa. Yeah. Who created that? I mean, what? That's yeah. amazing. You know? Amen. Amen. Marie D. Jones, best-selling author, screenwriter, researcher, radio show host, public speaker. Screenwriter? Tell us a little bit about that. What's you know, going on I there? Actually, people don't know this about me because I've written so many nonfiction books. But when I was a teenager, I started out writing short horror stories. I wanted to be Stephen King. Mm. And I published some of them. I published science fiction short stories. And in my 20s, I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to get into screenwriting. I lived in L.A. I was pitching and doing all kinds of stuff. And nothing really gelled much. Um, and then I got into nonfiction. I've been doing that for a long time, but I felt in the last year, a couple of years, I really wanted to do everything. I wanted to go back to my roots of storytelling. And I signed with a manager, Italia Gandolfo, who uh, my first novel came out a couple of months ago, believe it or not, written with my young son. Mm. I've written a book with my dad called oh. Super Volcano. And now I have a book out with my son, which Very is cool. about a spy group that he formed when he was being bullied in school mm. called Echo. <laughs> and I have another novel series coming out in July. I've got screenplays that have been optioned. For me, it's just if you're a writer, you write. doesn't matter. I'll write a box top if, you know, <laughs> it's creative and exciting. Um, but I think it's added a lot to my nonfiction because, like you, like you were just talking about, you know, when you do a lot of research and you're looking at facts and statistics and this stuff, you kind of start to lose the awe and wonder. Sure. And sometimes storytelling brings it back. And yeah. I'm starting to feel like a kid again. It's really cool. <laughs> so now when I approach the nonfiction, uh, Larry and I have a, a book a book deal we're about to sign. I can't say what it is yet, but I have a whole new sense of, ooh, I'm excited. You know, it's like sure. a little, that little kid enthusiasm. Marie so D. Jones. I just love to write. That's what I was destined to do. Oh, destined to do. <laughs> but, right. you know, people, but it's true. I can't mm. do anything else. Right. I don't want to do anything else, you know, except talk. I'm good at talking. <laughs> um, but, yeah, but again, people say, well, if it's just destiny, then why don't I just give up because my life is all planned? No, it's not. No, no, no. no. you still got plenty of choice. Marie D. Jones, thank you so much. Well, it, it's been a you. great conversation. I would love to do this again. Let's, Let's uh, do it again. I have a feeling we didn't even scratch the surface. <laughs> I know. We just got started. This was the... Uh, this was the preliminary, that was an awesome interview. Thank you so much for taking the time oh, to talk you. to us. thank you. You take care. We'll talk again. All right. You take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right, bye.